Well, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Tara. And I just want to say what a privilege it is to be here today uh, to speak to you about stem cells and the kidney. Uh, I uh, remember my high school science teachers very fondly, and one in particular, Tucker Hyatt, who was a, a physics teacher, um, uh, who always emphasized the experimental method and was a bit of a philosopher and would have a different uh, philosophy quote up on the board every week. And uh, uh, although I uh, may not have struck him as the most promising science student at the time, uh, uh, I toyed with the idea of, of um, concentrating in philosophy as an undergrad, eventually um, concentrated in English literature, but came full circle to the MD and PhD degrees. And, um, and I think in no small part it's due to the spark that he kindled way back when. So, so you are all, as you know, are in wonderful positions to influence the career trajectories of a great many uh, young people. And, um, uh, and so I'm very happy to talk to you today. So you'll notice the title of my uh, talk is Towards Stem Cell Therapy for Kidney Failure. And I would emphasize towards um, uh, uh, because we are not there yet, in fact, as you'll uh, see, we don't even know if stem cells exist in the kidney. And so what I will explain to you is why we think they might exist and how we're going about uh, answering the question of whether they exist. And uh, I think it's important in a field as exciting and fast moving as stem cell biology is uh, to uh, sometimes pause and take a step back, and you might have heard this already this week, if you think back to gene therapy 15 years ago, which uh, uh, occupied a similar position in the public psyche uh, wherein we thought cystic fibrosis would be cured within, you know, by 2000 and, and, and in fact there has been no significant um, application to stem cell therapy, uh, to, excuse me, to gene therapy yet. So, so I think um, uh, it's a wonderful field and yet uh, at the same time we have to be very careful about the goals that we set. Um, uh, and so with that proviso, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. And um, there's plenty of time for interruptions during the course of the talk and afterwards, so I welcome your questions. I want to review for you the uh, kidney structure and function briefly, uh, and, and then really review the clinical problem, which is a very significant one uh, in the United States and worldwide. And then I'll talk to you about the capacity and hopefully convince you that the kidney has a wonderful capacity to repair itself after injury and why this capacity for repair makes us think that stem cells might uh, uh, be responsible for that and how finally we're going about trying to identify those stem cells. So just by way of <coughs> review, the kidney is a filter and if you take a nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney, and stretch it all out in a line, what you'll get is this yellow uh, cartoon here. And up at the uh, head of the nephron is the glomerulus. This is the barrier between the blood and the urinary space within the kidney. And it is in the glomerulus that the filtrate is generated. So aqueous uh, fluid, water, small molecules, salts, uh, magnesium phosphate are all filtered here, but blood and large proteins like albumin are retained. The filtrate is then subject to active reabsorption of uh, salt, amino acids, other molecules, uh, some small proteins, vitamins, as well as active secretion of nitrogenous wastes, wastes and other compounds that the kidney needs to excrete leading to ultimately the formation of urine, which uh, uh, can be concentrated or dilute depending on whether uh, the uh, person has been drinking a lot of fluid or eating a high salt diet. The nephron is surrounded and bathed by a plexus of capillaries, which is responsible for reabsorbing the uh, uh, molecules and fluids as well as uh, secreting, uh, secreting them. Now, the, uh, in reality, the mammalian kidney has a more complex structure, and um, uh, although still simplified, uh, you can see here the way uh, mammalian kidneys generally uh, are laid out with the glomerulus at the head in the cortical region of the kidney with uh, this thick uh, area of the tubule called the proximal tubule outlined here. Uh, 
being the area where it's the workhorse of the nephron, it's where the bulk of sodium and water are reabsorbed under active processes requiring a lot of energy and oxygen. And we will come back to this fact because due to the workhorse nature of this segment, it is also the segment most susceptible to injury. The loop of Henle here is also called the concentrating segment. It is responsible for the generation of a very concentrated uh, uh, hyperosmolar interstitium, which allows the kidney to, uh, uh, under the action of the ascending limb, uh, reabsorb sodium and chloride, but not water, resulting in a very dilute fluid at the head of the collecting duct. And uh, under the action of antidiuretic hormone, which regulates the water permeability of the collecting duct, uh, the one can generate either a very dilute urine if this collecting duct remains impermeant to water, or uh, a very concentrated urine if it remains uh, permeable to water under the influence of antidiuretic hormone. So what does the kidney look like? Uh, this is a cross-section of a mouse kidney, and that's what I'll be talking about today. The uh, mouse and human kidneys are similar, although not exactly alike, but for our purposes, uh, we'll just focus on the mouse. And here you see a section in the cortex uh, which contain, which is this area all the way around uh, the outer capsule of the kidney, and it is the cortex which contains the glomeruli outlined here. The afferent and efferent arteriole, which has the blood supply, would come in here, and there is a, a plexus in here which um, uh, allows the filtrate to be formed in this kind of white crescent here, which would then en empty into a tubule, and you can see these tubules are surrounding the glomerulus. These tubules here would all be proximal tubules which end up having a very wavy and convoluted uh, uh, geography. <coughs> now the uh, workhorse segment is here, it's in the outer medulla, and it is characterized <coughs> by this thick brush border which appears lavender in this micrograph. This brush border increases the surface area of these epithelial cells hundreds of fold which allows them to uh, uh, accomplish all of this water and salt reabsorption in a relatively short distance. And finally, we have the papilla. This is that area that contains the loop. These are the collecting ducts which are sensitive to the actions of antidiuretic hormone. One thing I want you to um, notice and store away uh, for future reference is that in the outer medulla, and indeed in all um, areas of the kidney, there are really at least two different compartments that one can imagine. And the first is the epithelial tubular compartment, shown here with these thick cells with the brush border, um, and that those comprise the nephrons. Uh, there is the area in between the tubules, however, that is not simply an empty space, um, although it may appear that way because the cells in between the tubules are much, much smaller and thinner and wispy. But you can see their nuclei here in, in, around the red circle, uh, in, and this compartment is called the interstitium. This includes fibroblasts, mononuclear cells, endothelial cells, because there is a vascular plexus surrounding all of these tubules. And um, it is this interstitium, which is one area that we think could harbor, or that we hypothesized could harbor stem cells for reasons that I'll get into. So what about the burden of kidney disease? Um, End-stage renal disease, which is uh, this point at which kidneys lose their function entirely, uh, first of all, is very common due to uh, diabetes and hypertension. Its prevalence is increasing due primarily to the increasing prevalence of diabetes. And what you can see here in uh, relatively old data, in 2002, there were 431,000 patients in this country who have end-stage renal failure, meaning their kidneys do not function at all. That's divided up into a dialysis population of 300,000 and a population who has received kidney transplants, which is about 100,000. And these lines have increased uh, linearly since uh, 2002. So there are many people that are affected. Uh, furthermore, it is a uh, uh, a bad disease in terms of outcomes. 
we don't usually think of kidney failure in the same category as cancer, but uh, actually, in terms of mortality, uh, receiving a diagnosis of end-stage renal disease uh, uh, gives a patient a worse prognosis than receiving a diagnosis of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, or prostate cancer, with 100,000 deaths per year attributable to kidney failure. Only lung cancer has more deaths by way of comparison. It's also costly, which uh, should not be a surprise. The uh, care for patients that have kidney failure uh, requires $25 billion per year. That's more than the entire NIH budget. And the cost of caring for patients with kidney failure is disproportionate, such that if you take the entire Medicare payment pie, 6% of that goes to the care of kidney failure patients. However, only 0.7% of, of Medicare beneficiaries have end-stage renal disease. So it's tenfold more expensive than the average Medicare beneficiary. End-stage renal disease has different causes. Is it different diseases in a sense? This is just sort of the overall This is case. the overall global view. There are many different causes, including immune causes, uh, some drugs, uh, um, but the uh, in terms of uh, the number one cause of kidney failure, it's diabetes and hypertension. Not everybody that has diabetes will get kidney failure. In fact, only about 10% of diabetics develop kidney failure. However, there are so many diabetics that even 10% of that number it turns out to be a tremendous uh, burden. So that's chronic kidney failure. There uh, is uh, acute kidney injury, which is a process that I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about. And this is, uh, uh, the, uh, this is defined by the sudden loss of kidney failure rather than the gradual decline. This also can be due to many different causes. It's usually found in hospitalized patients. Like chronic kidney disease, the incidence is increasing overall. Whether you, diagnose, whether you divide that up by age, by sex, or by race, uh, and um, perhaps more importantly, uh, the development of acute kidney injury, which generally is reversible, as we will discuss, um, is not benign. It is associated with significant increases in the risk of mortality. One of the ways that we measure kidney function is by serum creatinine. Creatinine is the byproduct of normal muscle metabolism and it's usually excreted by the kidney. However, when the kidney fails, the creatinine level will rise in the blood because the kidney is no longer excreting it appropriately. And the point of this slide is that even relatively small, what in the past most clinicians would have ignored, uh, small rises in creatinine are associated with very significant increases in the risk of death in hospitalized patients. Four, six, 10, and 16 fold risk of death with uh, even what we still would require call, call relatively mild degrees of acute, acute renal failure. Moreover, the development of acute kidney injury long-term is associated with the development of chronic kidney failure. So, uh, so I'm a, an avid skier, and, and so I get some throwaway skiing magazines, and here we see Ultimate Adventures nine trips worth selling a kidney for. So <laughs> you might, uh, you know, and I could have, you know, depending on how, what the trip was, I suppose, you could consider it, except that it's illegal. But, uh, um, but this raises the question of, well, what about transplantation? Transplantation should, should be the answer. And indeed, transplantation is wonderful and has really changed the outcomes for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Um, however, it's not the, the answer for uh, two main reasons. The first is there just aren't enough kidneys. So uh, yesterday I queried the UNOS website and this data is freely, freely available. It shows day by day the number of patients in the United States waiting for a kidney. There were 72,314 patients waiting for a kidney in the country yesterday. And if you looked at the first four months of this year, only 9,213 kidney transplants had been performed. So if you do the mental math, on average then, uh, uh, it would take a person two and a half years to get a kidney because we're just not performing enough compared to how many are on the list. And in fact, for various reasons, uh, the average wait for a kidney is 3.5 years. And as a result, 
uh, many people die on the list waiting for a kidney because there aren't enough. So, uh, so that is the clinical burden. This is the reason why I study kidney disease because there are uh, there is a great need um, to find therapies for kidney failure. And uh, uh, but let me, uh, by way of introducing stem cells in the kidney, give you a case history of a patient I took care of about a year and a half ago. Uh, this was a 31-year-old woman who uh, came into the hospital to deliver uh, on. Uh, her first pregnancy, she had had a normal course. She delivered a healthy baby boy on January 15th. Uh, everything seemed to be fine. However, overnight, the nurses noted that she uh, did not uh, have any urine output, and uh, so labs were checked. They wouldn't normally even be checked. This showed acute renal failure, low platelets, and hepatic failure. And she was, we were called to see her, and she was diagnosed with a syndrome called HELP syndrome. It's actually very rare. It's called, it stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. This is a disorder where the endothelium becomes clogged and sticky, and uh, the kidney becomes starved of blood. Its pathogenesis is not well understood. But what I want to show you is this graph here, which shows her serum creatinine. Remember, that's how we measure kidney function. Normal serum creatinine is about one. And so when we saw her, it was two, and it rose linearly, and that was because her muscles were producing creatinine, but her kidneys weren't excreting it, to the point where at the red arrows, we had to dialyze her. That caused the creatinine to fall because we dialyzed the creatinine off with our dialysis machine. But even after we finished, the creatinine was still going up because the kidneys were still not recovering. However, right about here, she started making a little urine, and that increased day by day we dialyzed her one more time, but after that dialysis, her creatinine didn't rise anymore. And the reason for that was the kidney had repaired itself. And so this is one thing that distinguishes the kidney from organs like the brain or heart, whereby if you have a heart attack or a stroke, the tissue uh, turns into a scar and doesn't regenerate, whereas the kidney has this ability, like the liver, to repair itself to a remarkable degree. Her and this patient's kidney function now is completely normal. So we model this uh, type of acute kidney injury and repair in the laboratory in mice with a model called ischemia reperfusion injury. And uh, what this involves is clamping the renal arteries to the mouse's kidneys, clamping both of them, and then unclamping them after 30 minutes. And this clamping interrupts the flow of blood and oxygen to the kidney and results in um, what you'll see here, namely, it results in uh, a mouse creatinine that normally is about 0.2, and it results in kidney failure that recovers over three to seven days. By seven days, it's all the way back down to normal. When we look at sections of the kidney, um, what, uh, and soon after injury, what you see is a massive cell death with lumens clogged with dead epithelial cells, some lumens clogged with a hyaline uh, fluid, uh, and um, inflammatory cells and injury everywhere. However, if you look a few days later, what you see um, is cell proliferation. And this marker right here is a marker for cell proliferation. And it doesn't show up all that well, but each nucleus here is proliferating. And so these damaged tubules are in the process of regenerating themselves. And so the central question is, where do these cells come from? And could it be a stem cell that is responsible for all of this cell proliferation? One way that we can quantitate the amount of cell proliferation that occurs is by the BRDU labeling. You may have heard of this already. Bromodeoxyuridine is a thymidine analog and is incorporated into strands of DNA that is being synthesized uh, by dividing cells. Once it is incorporated into the DNA, it stays there for the life of the cell, and we can detect it with antibodies. So in the experiment I'm about to show you, we subjected a mouse to injury and then continuously labeled it with BRDU, and after seven days, we sacrificed the mouse. And in control kidneys, in uh, kidneys that were not injured, what you see is a very low level of proliferation. Now here in green are the tubules with the nuclei in black, and uh, the red nuclei are the nuclei that have divided because they express bromodeoxyuridine. And you can see here is a, one cell that divided into two, such that each daughter cell has BRDU. 
That's why usually we see two cells. When we only see one, it's because the other nucleus is out of the plane of focus. So the bottom line is that only 2% of cells under the uninjured kidney divide during one week. But seven days after injury uh, in an injured kidney, about 70% of cells have divided. So what this really attests to is the dramatic capacity of the kidney to repair itself after injury. If you look at one individual nephron here, every single nucleus in that nephron uh, it has incorporated BRDU, suggesting that it has regenerated itself in its entirety. So if we want to ask the question, where do these cells come from, it's important to have a model ahead of time that uh, we can work from and test. And so this slide shows three different potential origins for cells uh, during repair. And if we take the um, uh, uninjured nephron up here and subject it to ischemic injury, what we get is that uh, necrosis and apoptosis and cell death here. But then during the repair phase, you could envision one of three things happening. First, any cell that survived the insult might have the capability on its own to proliferate and then redifferentiate and uh, reconstitute the tubule. Now this would not be a model that would require stem cells because by definition you're saying that any single cell that survives has the capability to proliferate. So there's no unique cell that, um, that has the capacity to, um, that has a better capacity to proliferate than other cells. The, there are two other stem cell models that you might envision. One would be an intratubular stem cell in which a subset of surviving cells become activated and proliferate and thus the regenerated tubule derived from that original stem cell, marked in green here. Or you could in invoke stem cells that are outside of the tubule. Remember those interstitial cells that I showed you earlier that might migrate into the tubule and uh, accomplish the same thing. Yes? Um, I was just wondering if there was any information that you guys have done about how long or how dead it has to be before that sort of stops. So you said 30 minutes on the, on the mouse. Is that as long as you've been able to go before you start to see proliferation? So it turns out that it's a continuum. So you can, um, we can do 20 minutes and we will still see injury, but it won't be 70% of cells that proliferated, it will be 35%. Uh, we could do 10 minutes of injury, the creatinine won't even rise, but we would still get some minor 10, you know, maybe 5% proliferation, and with less than 10 minutes we don't see any injury at all. Uh, by contrast, if we go up to 45 or 60 minutes, the injury is so severe that the kidney becomes infarcted, and it's, it, its a capacity to repair has been overwhelmed. Yes? The, the, if you don't injure the kidney, how, long, how often do the cells divide? So that's a good question, and I think this control micrograph gives you some idea. This was BRDU labeling over the course of seven days, and when we counted up these rare nuclei here, it turned out to be about 2% of cells that had divided seven every seven days. days. And so the, then you can do the calculation, yeah. and I think the half-life of, of a cell would be somewhere around uh, two to four months or so, which is quite a long time for adult, adult cells. If you think of the gut, the cells in the gut completely renew themselves within three to five days. So, um, so I've introduced to you the concept of the kidney's ability to repair and this proliferative capacity. Um, what about the potential role of stem cells, and specifically adult stem cells, in this process? And you guys have been hearing a lot about that this week. Um, in particular, uh, lung stem cells uh, earlier from Carla Kim. And uh, there are a variety of other stem cells that have been uh, proven or hypothesized, including in the intestine. Uh, as well as in uh, germ cells, in the heart, in skeletal muscle, mesenchymal stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells. The one thing I want to point out here on this cartoon is that uh, there's no kidney <laughs> in this cartoon. There's a, there's a liver and a spleen, but there's no kidney where, where it should be. Uh, and I think that's because we really don't know whether there are stem cells. And so, uh, 
I want to tell you about how we've gone about trying to answer the question of whether stem cells might be responsible. And we've taken a clue from development. And uh, I was speaking earlier uh, with one of you about the collaborations that have come about as a result of uh, the excitement around stem cell biology. And this uh, data that I'll show you is one such collaboration between developmental biologists whom traditionally adult nephrologists such as myself don't really talk to all that much uh, and vice versa um, uh, that has been very, very fruitful. And so that's one uh, thing that's been nice about this field is it's brought together scientists from different backgrounds. <laughs> so just to, to review very briefly how the kidney is formed during embryogenesis, this yellow structure is called the ureteric bud and it invades into an area called the uh, mesenchyme. And these cells right here uh, condense and glue together and become a pretubular condensate. And they epithelialize and form a lumen, which will ultimately be the center of the nephron. And then they plumb themselves into the ureteric bud, which becomes the collecting duct. And a glomerulus is formed and it uh, uh, enlarges and becomes much more complex. And this process is repeated about a million times. The point that I want to make is that uh, the stem cells of the kidney during embryogenesis, if you will, are located here in the condensing mesenchyme. And this compartment uh, is analogous to the interstitial compartment that I showed you earlier. And so uh, um, we reasoned that this might be an area that could harbor adult stem cells if some of those cells persisted in the adult. There, um, is some tantalizing evidence from lower vertebrates. This is a picture from a skate kidney. Uh, and um, although you wouldn't think that it would be so similar to ours or a mouse's kidney, it actually is. There's a glomerulus here and many tubular structures uh, that form uh, the nephrons of the skate. If you perform injury on a skate kidney, what you see is down here at the bottom a group of cells in the interstitium that appear to expand and then condense and then plumb themselves into existing nephrons in a way that seems very much to recapitulate embryogenesis. And so again, the question is, do such cells exist in man? Uh, do they exist in the interstitium? And can we identify them? And so the experimental approach that we have taken to answer that question is outlined here. We have um, genetically labeled the epithelial cells. And here in this cartoon, uh, the blue cells are those plump, thick epithelial cells of the nephron. And we've genetically labeled them so that they express a marker gene called LAC-Z. You've probably heard some about this previously. But we have, on purpose, left the interstitial cells unlabeled. And so the idea would be to perform injury. Many of these blue cells will die. Some will be left over. But then we will allow repair to occur uh, and check a week later whether the repaired nephron has been diluted by unlabeled cells, which would suggest that a stem cell came from an extra tubular compartment, or whether the nephron remained blue, which would suggest that if stem cells existed in the kidney, they originate from within the tubule. And I'll just review very briefly, since this is something you've probably been introduced to before, the um, genetic uh, approach that we take to labeling these epithelial cells is to take uh, one mouse that has this allele here, shown in cartoon format, that uh, has a strong promoter at the 5 prime end, followed by a LOX-P site. This is a 34 base pair recognition site for the um, P1 bacteriophage uh, uh, CRE enzyme. CRE is a recombinase. And there are two LOX-P sites flanking a stop sequence. And what this actually is is three strong polyadenylation si signals, one after the other, such that the um, uh, transcription of this message will stop right here. And this reporter gene, LAC-Z, in this case, will not be transcribed or translated. However, if we take a kidney-specific or epithelial-specific promoter driving the Cree recombinase, what we get 
is these two lox p sites line, line up next to each other and this stop sequence is excised, leaving the strong promoter a single lox p site which is silent driving the reporter expression. This uh, type of scenario is um, outlined in vitro here and in this case uh, the allele was a bit complicated because in addition to a stop there was actually a lac z allele in front of the stop with an alkaline phosphatase after. So before recombination here, uh, you will have blue cells, and after recombination, you'll have purple. And so this is shown on the right-hand side, and if you look, if you divide this up into columns, in the first column, what we have is a plasmid encoding this allele that was transfected alone. And when we did a lac Z assay, what you see are blue cells but when we did an alkaline phosphatase assay, we didn't see any purple cells. When we co-transfected a Cree enzyme, shown here in green, we had recombination. We no longer had blue cells, but we did have purple. So the idea is to apply this kind of technology to the animal in order to create a model for the genetic lineage, for tracing the genetic lineage of cells during repair. And conceptually, the most important thing to understand with this model is that the lac -Z enzyme is encoded uh, by a DNA sequence that is present on the genome of a cell, such that once the recombination has occurred, that recombination event is transmitted to any daughter cell, so that that mother cell will be blue, but any time that cell divides, both daughter cells will be blue, and so on, and so on. So what we did was cross a mouse that expresses this lac -Z reporter, which is not blue in the absence of Cree, and crossed it against a mouse that has a Cree, enzy a Cree enzyme um, driven by a kidney transcription factor to generate in the <coughs> F1 generation a mouse with blue kidneys. And that is shown here. In the upper panel, we have the lac -Z mouse alone that does not have the Cree allele, and in the lower panel we have a biogenic animal that has both the Lexi and the Cree alleles, and you can see uh, that the nephrons here at low power and at higher power are all blue, very continuously blue. We can also do this same technique using a red reporter, uh, This, in this case red fluorescent protein derived from fluorescent coral, and it doesn't show up very well here, but in this instance you get a red fluorescent kidney instead of a blue one. Now, one of the uh, important um, controls for this experiment was to show that the interstitium was not labeled. And uh, because after all we were looking for a stem cell, that uh, we hypothesized might be present in the interstitium. So if there were any blue cells in the interstitium, then and, and they migrated into the tubule, then they were blue to start and blue to finish, and we wouldn't be able to exclude uh, dilution. And so here, using that red mouse that I showed you, um, uh, you can see in the cortex, in green, in red are the, the nephrons, and in green is a blood vessel and what's clear is there are no yellow cells, so that there is, is no red cell that expresses a blood vessel marker, and there's no green cell that expresses a red epithelial marker. The same thing is true down here for epithelial cells, in green, uh, for endothelial cells, excuse me. In green, you can see the um, vasculature surrounding the tubules, and finally, this F480 is a macrophage marker, and it shows you that there are macrophages that are surrounding these tubules as well. But the main point is that the interstitial compartment was not labeled. Now, again, through this collaboration with Andrew McMahon's group uh, here at, at Harvard in the FAS, we were able to perform experiments asking the inverse. And so before I show you the result, I just want to review this. One, um, one caveat to this dilution experiment is that um, you could question how much sensitivity we had to detect dilution because the blue stain is quite intense and what if there were some um, non-blue cells that we missed in between. And so an easier way 
uh, or a more sensitive way to ask that question would be to look for gain of signal. And so in this case, we labeled the interstitium blue, but kept the nephrons uh, unlabeled. And here, after injury and repair, if an interstitial cell contributed to the repair, we'd expect to see gain of blue in the nephrons. Or if an interstitial population was not responsible, then the nephrons would remain unlabeled. And this mouse doesn't show up as well because, as I explained earlier, the interstitial cells are thin and wispy, and so it's, uh, uh, you can get a, a, a sense for these thin and, and wispy cells that are labeled blue here. But really, what you mainly see is the absence of blue in the tubules. And so uh, we then went on to perform these injury experiments. And again, to remind you, this is what the kidney looks like before injury. And soon after injury, you see uh, tubules that have necrotic and apoptotic cells in the lumen. These will all be flushed out eventually. You see thin some cells that have remained that are very flat, have lost their brush border. They're de-differentiated and, and injured. And some, uh, some tubules that are full of uh, hyaline fluid that has been, um, that has formed concretions. And so in short, you see dramatic injury. But even at this early stage, if you uh, take an extract of the kidney and probe for a marker of cell proliferation here, PCNA, which is proliferating cell nuclear antigen, and you compare an uninjured kidney with an injured kidney, you can see a dramatic upregulation of cell proliferation so that even two days after injury, the cell has already begun to repair itself. And in these same mice, we can reassure ourselves that this was not only a significant injury, but that a significant amount of repair occurred because we can measure their serum creatinine. And remember that a mouse has a normal serum creatinine of about 0.2, and one day after injury, it was tenfold higher almost to 1.9, but then it fell back down to 0.2 by day 15, proving that these cells had completely functionally restored themselves. So what happens then when we look at the labeled cells? And here, what you can see on the left-hand side are the uninjured labeled kidneys. And this, in this case, we have the red marker, red fluorescent protein. And we have a co-stain with a marker, key 67 which uh, stains the nuclei of cells that are proliferating. And again, in the uninjured state, we've already reviewed that there's very little cell proliferation. However, after injury, there's massive cell proliferation. What I want to point out is that these green nuclei here, 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 are all surrounded by red cytoplasm. And even in cases where we see severe injury with a very flattened cell, we can see at the heads of these arrows thin green nuclei indicating that cell proliferation is going on even in this severely injured nephron. So the conclusion from this experiment was that the marked cells have the capacity to proliferate on their own. So this is, um, if you will, evidence against uh, invading stem cell that would be unlabeled because what we should be seeing are um, proliferating intratubular cells with green nuclei but, not, but no red cytoplasm. When we do high power um, imaging, we can see in some cases cells that are in the middle of mitosis here. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see the individual chromosomes in blue being uh, surrounded by the green proliferation marker. And again, the cytoplasm is all red. Um, and in this case, we can see a green proliferating epithelial cell and another one here. And in the interstitium, in between these two tubules, a green nucleus with no red cytoplasm that's presumably a fibroblast or an endothelial cell. We can convince ourselves soon after injury that there's BRDU incorporation, and this is just 48 hours after injury. Again, just um, proving that these cells are, are, are dividing very rapidly. And so what do we see after the kidney has repaired itself completely? Well, the bottom line is, if we look in the red kidney or the blue kidney, that they look very similar to what we started with. In other words, the nephrons remain red. Even nephrons that have not fully repaired, like this one here, which has a 
uh, thin rim of cytoplasm, all those cells remain red. And the same is true in the blue kidneys. The repaired uh, nephrons are all blue. There isn't any dilution by non-labeled cells. When we look at the mouse whose interstitial cells were labeled blue, subjected to injury and allowed to repair, we do not see any gain of blue. We don't see any nephrons that look like this. In fact, we just still see this kind of faint, wispy, blue interstitial staining. So the conclusion then from these experiments are that the kidney does indeed have a very dramatic capacity to repair itself and undergo many rounds of cell proliferation after injury. Uh, however, stem cells, um, uh, or more specifically interstitial stem cells, do not appear to contribute to um, this particular injury model. So where do we go from here, then? The, uh, the, the secondary conclusion from these studies are that if a stem cell exists, it exists within the tubule because it hasn't been diluted out. So how might we assess for the presence of stem cells within the tubule? Well, I um, have uh, a model here to show using similar techniques how we might begin to approach those questions. And Namely, this approach is to perform clonal analysis of single epithelial cells. Here, the approach would be to label a single epithelial cell instead of the whole tubule, perform injury, and allow the nephron to repair, and ask what does the nephron look like after it, it repairs. And we can envision three scenarios. The first is outlined here, where the nephron has lost its label. In this case, what we conclude was that the labeled cell was not a stem cell because it probably died during the injury and wasn't able to contribute any daughter cells that would have been labeled red to the repaired tubule. The second circumstance here where we see maybe three or four labeled cells is somewhat harder to interpret, but I would argue um, would still not be consistent with the presence of a tubular stem cell because it only divided a few times. In other words, these cells we would hypothesize would all be located next to each other since the cells would divide and maybe the daughter cells would divide one more time so you'd have four cells in a clump. Um, but uh, we would expect a stem cell to divide very rapidly, many fold, um, and that would be an exponential process. Um, and so after a week, we would have expected many more cells to be read. So I would argue that this result would not be consistent with a stem cell having been tagged here. Finally, we might envision seeing a completely red tubule. And in this instance, I think we can be sure that we had tagged the um, stem cell in the beginning because it had expanded many, many fold and reconstituted the entire nephron with its daughter cells. Yes? What happens if they're, after injury, if the remaining cells were different than the ones, to begin with, different than the ones that were more resistant, like to being killed and maybe you, you might get number two, even though it's a stem cell. Well, this is, that's exactly the question, which is very hard to, um, to answer in the absence of stem cell markers. So what you are um, uh, asking is, do stem cells have, uh, are they more resistant to injury? And in fact, in other organs, there's evidence to suggest that stem cells are more resistant yeah, to injury. Like um, and and, and in, in fact, you could think that they should be because they need to last the entire life of, of the organism. I think the only way to address that question is to look for markers of stem cells. So in the uninjured state, if those stem cells exist that are more resistant to injury, we should be able to find them in the uninjured kidney because they express some antigen telomerase or some other uh, typical stem cell marker that would distinguish them, them from their neighboring cells. And the challenge in the kidney is that these are very early days as far as characterizing stem cell markers in the nephron. And so, uh, in point of fact, we don't have any markers that convincingly distinguish one cell from another. What it seems to be is that each segment of the nephron is completely homogeneous. Now, that can either mean that 
all cells have the capability to proliferate as long as they survive after an injury, which would be a non-stem cell possibility, or that we haven't looked for the right markers. And it's just too early to know between those two factors. And you can even expand on your question because in order to do this experiment, we have to choose a promoter that's going to drive the Cree enzyme. And our choice of promoter will have a very large um, outcome on the experiment. So if we choose a promoter that is present only in terminally differentiated cells, for example, one that we wouldn't necessarily think a stem cell would express or need to express, then we would probably expect to get this type of um, uh, a scenario. So our challenge will be to choose promoters that we think are good candidates for stem cell markers in order to increase the chances that we see uh, uh, number three. But I think you know that you've touched on the heart of the matter in the kidney. So um, those are the, that's the main story. I have a couple more slides that I can talk about. Um, I want to acknowledge first my mentor, Joe Bonventry, my lab, uh, which consists of Savut Song, as well as a freshman, um, Wendy Ying, who um, is in between her freshman and sophomore year of college. And our collaborators, these are the developmental biologists, Andrew McMahon, uh, Andrew McMahon's lab, and his postdocs, Todd Valerius and Kyo Kobayashi, who made both of the cream mice that have been very important for these studies. So if there aren't further questions, I want to just introduce you to the challenge of single cell labeling. Um, so this cartoon that I showed you here that has a single labeled cell actually it technically is harder to achieve than one might think. The Cree recombinase system has been chosen in mammals because it is so efficient. And indeed, as you saw, our blue kidneys had blue nephrons everywhere. And so how, you might ask, are we going to get a single labeled cell? Turns out there is a powerful um, uh, new technology called uh, mitotic uh, recombination with double markers. And this enables um, single cell labeling. Here is one uh, labeled nephron. And um, it takes advantage of a different property of the Cree recombinase. Uh, what I showed you previously was intrachromosomal recombination mediated by Cree, in which one LOX P site is upstream of a second LOX P site. And in that instance, the recombinase will recognize both sites and snip out whatever's in between them. However, Cree can also recognize LOX P sites on different DNA strands. So this is called interchromosomal recombination. So what um, uh, Li Quin Luo at Stanford has devised is a very um, elegant mouse and powerful mouse which contains uh, on one of the mouse's chromosomes um, an allele in which on one side there's half of the GFP or the green fluorescent protein followed by a LOX P site, followed by half of the red fluorescent protein. Now, you can imagine that if you hook up half of a green fluorescent protein to half of a red fluorescent protein, you, you actually you don't get yellow, you just get nothing. It, it's uh, 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 not a fluorescent protein. On the um, sister chromosome, however, is the inverse. The missing half of the red fluorescent protein is first, separated by a LOX P site, followed by the missing half of the green fluorescent protein. So in this case, when Cree is present, it will mediate an exchange of the two chromosomes rather than snipping out the intervening DNA. And this will reconstitute, sorry, this will reconstitute uh, the green fluorescent protein on the top and the red fluorescent protein on the bottom, resulting in a yellow cell. Now the key property is that this interchromosomal recombination, as you might imagine, is very inefficient and occurs on the order of 0.01% to 0.1 to 0.01%. So you're only going to label about one in a thousand or one in 10,000 cells. But after all, that's what we need to label a single cell. This will then allow us to trace the fate of that single cell after, uh, after injury and we can see whether the yellow epithelial cell might turn 
the entire nephron yellow if we choose the right Cree, or whether it might just expand a little bit, or whether it's gone entirely. And so this is the approach that we're going to take to um, analyze for the presence of stem cells within the nephron in the future. So with that, I think I'll end, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? We've heard about lungs and uh, brains and now kidneys. Um, you hear a lot about lung cancer. You, know, you hear a lot about brain cancer. We don't hear a lot about kidney cancer. Is there some correlation there potentially with the presence or absence of stem cells? Well, that's a great question. I think um, Gary Gilliland, who, um, who heads up many uh, cancer stem cell efforts, um, has told me in the past that um, uh, he's told our group that he thinks we should be focusing on kidney cancer if we want to identify the kidney stem cell. And I think he has a good point because it does, uh, there's accumulating evidence, as you've heard, that cancer is a stem cell disease. And, um, and so the notion would be to take uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, biopsy specimens and subject them to the types of analyses that are being done in colon cancer and prostate cancer and others um, to identify markers for some putative renal stem cell, which we can then use in these analyses uh, to, for example, take their promoter and drive CRE and then perform lineage analysis. So I think that absolutely that is, um, that is a promising approach. And the reason you haven't heard a lot about it is that um, uh, similar to lung or pancreas or some of these other organs, um, it's still early days in the kidney. And so um, many of the building blocks and um, tools that are necessary to carry out those studies haven't been characterized in the kidney yet. Well, when I was mammals, you don't, it seems to me there's, uh, kidney cancer is much less prevalent than lung cancer or uh, brain cancer. I don't know if that's true. I mean, that seems to, I mean, it, it, it is. fear of people who have yes, kidney cancer. Yes, that's true. And I was wondering if you thought that meant there were fewer stem cells, if stem cell cancer is an issue here. Um, like no stem cells or It's hard for me to know wh whether the Relative, um, relatively low frequency, uh, frequency of renal cell carcinoma is a reflection somehow of the underlying stemness or non-stemness of that type of cancer. I think it's, a, it's an interesting hypothesis, but, um, but I'm not sure if that's telling us whether or not there are kidney stem cells or not. I think one, one extension of that question and that, that may have relevance is that the kidney itself, as I've shown you, the epithelial st cells cycle very slowly. And, and that's different from lung, that's different from the gut, where you have orders of magnitude more cell proliferation. And, um, and it is this cell proliferation that uh, leads to loss of homozygo homozygosity and the accumulation of, uh, of genetic errors. And so it may be more a reflection of the underlying rate of proliferation than anything else. But again, that's a little bit circular. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you whether a stem cell is, is at root. Yes? Why, why the increase in, in uh, AKI and, and other such um, disorders? Well, I think that um, that is a direct extension and reflection of the aging of the population and the incidence of underlying kidney disease, which may be subclinical in the population, which itself is a reflection of diabetes, hypertension, smoking, obesity. So that uh, patients who come into the hospital who need to um, have a procedure done or get a CAT scan um, are, are older now and have more uh, baseline kidney disease, although they might not even know it, and in fact there's sort of an epidemic of undiagnosed kidney disease uh, in the country, and that uh, puts them at much greater risk for developing acute kidney injury because they have less kidney reserve. And so I think uh, that's the answer for the increasing incidence of, of acute kidney injury. It certainly is the answer to the increasing uh, incidence of chronic kidney injury, but I think it also is feeding into acute acute kidney injury as well.
it looks like the kidney is very good at repairing itself when you injure it and give it back um, its blood supply. Is lack of blood supply um, one of the reasons that diabetes causes the end stage renal failure? What yes. happens yes. that the kidney no longer repairs itself? Well, that's an excellent question too that, that, that leads into a lot of things. I think the, the short answer is that the, um, the lesions in diabetes are twofold. One is at the level of the glomerulus where the high circulating sugars um, over time cause damage to this filtration barrier which is very delicate and um, lead to protein leakage into the tubule and this protein leakage ultimately is toxic to the epithelial cells. The second component of the diabetic kidney is uh, microvascular disease and you know vascular disease is a very large component of diabetes and that uh, itself will contribute to some kind of chronic ischemic damage in the diabetic kidney. Um, now, uh, the the issue of why the kidney, if the, if the kidney is so, to paraphrase, if the kidney is so good at healing itself, like I just showed you, you know, why can't it just heal itself in diabetes? And there are some people um, who have argued that many um, chronic disorders are disorders of stem cell depletion. So right there, that would be one answer. Like, you know, my hairline is receding, and actually there's very good evidence that that's because my bulge stem cells in the skin are pooping out, and they're not regenerating my hair. Uh, and so maybe in the kidney, the kidney stem cells, wherever they are, are getting depleted by this chronic stress. So in the absence of diabetes, we have enough kidney stem cells to last us 100 years or however long, but that um, but there's chronic damage and that they are dividing at a, a higher rate, a higher basal rate, and that in fact they are repairing the kidney over time, but that over decades they they poop out also. So that would be that would be one um, sort of stem cell biased answer to your question. Um, I think uh, it doesn't have to be stem cell based either if there aren't kidney stem cells, it may be that the kidney's dramatic capacity to repair itself is, you know, finite as well, and that the epithelial cells themselves can divide many times, but not infinitely. Um, there is this concept of telomere shortening, have you heard about this? So, so that again, you reach the Hayflick limit at some point, and, um, uh, and cell senescence sets in. So those would be the two, the stem cell and the non-stem cell answer, I think, to that. To that. Question. A very general question. It's sort of two questions in one. But uh, how do you, you said there were no known markers for kidneys? How do you find a marker? And, and the other question is, can you use um, like a um, microarray to find one? Or yeah. So do you have enough cells for that? Or? Yes. So that's a good question. And I think really those the, what the the two things that you um, uh, mention are are the primary me me means of doing it. One is you choose candidate markers one by one based on what we know in other organs. And this is where um, uh, environments like the one here in Boston is very productive because we get to hear what are the markers in pancreas and what are the markers in the crypt and in, in the skin. And, um, and it, you know, it turns out there's great diversity in nature, but on the other hand, uh, it makes sense that stem cells in one organ might share markers with stem cells in the other. So, so the first is just to pick a marker um, based on what is already known. And, um, uh, but the second is to take a sort of non-biased high throughput approach. And that can be done in uh, many different ways. One would be arrays, and certainly um, uh, one thing that folks have done is take uninjured kidneys and extract their RNA, and then take injured kidneys at different time points after injury when all of the cell proliferation is taking place and extract the RNA, and then subject them to um, uh, RNA arrays or proteomic analysis and ask the question, well, what proteins are upregulated after, after injury and generate a list of candidate markers that way. Because one would imagine that um, after injury, when there's so much cell proliferation, that this stem cell compartment is going to be expanded. And so whatever markers distinguish it from its neighboring cells, there should be more of them 
present in the injured and repairing kidney than there are in the basal state. And so, um, and so I think both approaches are ones that are being taken, uh, uh, being taken now. But I, the thing that I would, that I want to, you know, circle back to is that markers are great, and we have to, we need markers to perform our experiments. But in the end, what happens in a petri dish, you know, may not reflect what's happening in biology. And there are, um, you know, five papers out there saying that interstitial uh, stem cells exist in the adult kidney, and these investigators are all good investigators, and they've taken candidate markers um, present in other organs and said, "Hey, look, there's a CD133 positive cell in the interstitium, and CD133 is a is a neural is is a brain stem cell marker. So um, let's let's collect those interstitial CD133 positive cells, which they've done, and they put them into a dish, and they seem to grow and." Um, have characteristics of epithelial cells, and so they've concluded that this is a, is, this is a stem cell. And it, it may be, or at least it may, might have stem-like properties, but the point is, if it's unable to contribute to the repair of the damaged nephron, then what is it that you're looking at, and what relevance does it have to human biology? So I think um, the markers are great, and we can't do anything unless we know um, what we are looking at, and we need both candidate and high throughput approaches to identify markers, but at the end of the day, you have to do, use the injury model. And I would argue that the lineage tracing technique, although it's laborious, is probably the gold standard for determining whether your candidate cell of interest um, is actually a stem cell in vivo. Might those uh, tubular markers be something like um, receptors? growth factor receptors or cytokine receptors? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, I think there is increasing um, knowledge of the pathways that are important for self-renewal of stem cells in other tissues. And examples of those receptors include uh, Wnt ligands and hedgehog ligands and their receptors. And um, uh, and certainly the kidney does express uh, components of each of those pathways. They, um, at least to the extent that it's been looked at, don't seem to express them in a restricted fashion. So again, um, if you look for hedgehog um, receptors, they seem to be fairly broad spread uh, throughout the kidney. So, which again raises the question, uh, if you're looking for a restricted subset, that is going to replenish you know, the whole kidney and you want a marker for it, you wouldn't expect it to be expressed everywhere. But I think those are very good things candidates. Things like a platelet-derived growth factor, mm -hmm. or, you know, things that might just be more responsive to injury. Yes, and um, PD, uh, platelet-derived growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor, epidermal growth factor um, are all known to be important and in some cases uh, are known to actually accelerate repair when given exogenously. Um, and so the targets for those uh, growth factors in some cases are known and in some cases are not known. Okay, well thanks again for your time. It's really <laughs>